Um, so I think we'll get going here if you guys are yeah. all good with that. Brandon um, and Brandon. Yeah. Sorry. So William is just asking a quick question. All the all the attendees are already on mute. It's just us that yeah. have mics, so you don't have to worry about muting yourself. You should all be muted. Yeah, then, I think you're able to change it if you have a question during our question. Yeah. Um, no, no problem. So, um, I, I think we'll get going here. Hi, everyone. My name is Zoe Mile. Um, I'm the communications and safe sport coordinator for Archery Canada. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we're so excited that we get to uh, host this webinar presented by uh, one of our sponsors, Canada Archery Online, uh, choosing the right equipment. We're joined today by two wonderful guest speakers, uh, Gordon True, the owner of Canada Archery Online, he's waving right there, uh, and Brandon Schwerab, who's a technician and retail consultant with Canada Archery Online. Did I get that right, Brandon? The... Yeah, I mean, yeah, perfect. That's pretty much what I do. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so just a couple of housekeeping things. The first part of this webinar is going to be a video that I'll be sharing from my screen. So. Um, uh, you'll see that it'll start in just a second here. We will have time for questions. I'm going to pause the video halfway through just in case you have questions kind of about the first half of the video and Gordon and Brandon can uh, answer them for you. And then we'll have another time, of course, at the end to ask any questions. So if you have uh, questions, you can either put them in the chat or you can hold on to them and ask them during one of those question periods. As Brandon mentioned, uh, attendees are just kind of automatically muted. Um, Brandon and Gordon, of course, as our panelists are not. So uh, they'll be able to answer your questions whenever we get to that point. Um, and I think just so everyone knows this meeting is being, this webinar is being recorded. It'll be put on our YouTube later. So you can rewatch and re-listen to if you would like. And I think that is everything. So I'm gonna go ahead and play this video and we will mute ourselves so you don't hear our background noise and we'll go from there. Thank you everyone again for joining. Hi, this is Brandon from Canada Archery Online, and today is your beginner's guide to getting your first bow. This video is made in conjunction with Archery Canada, the national governing body for archery. And if you're looking into getting into it or finding a club or instructor, they can definitely help you out with that. So today we're gonna to give you a brief overview on choosing the right bow for you. Whether you wanna shoot traditional, Olympic, hunting, compound, any of it, we can help you out with that. Now this is going to be a very general um, preview on what these different bows look like, what the setup is, approximate budget, um, but if you are looking to get into archery, we will always recommend to taking lessons first and consulting with the coach before making any purchase of equipment. That way you can get assessed properly and ensure that we help you choose the bow that is definitely best for your intended shooting purposes. The first style of archery we're going to show you is going to be traditional archery. Now uh, there's a multiple factors that would persuade someone to get started into traditional style of shooting. Uh, mainly because it's often seen as the purest form of archery that is most similar to what is historically known as archery. Um, it is also one of the more versatile forms, whereas you're not stuck into a specific style of shooting. You can kind of adapt your form in multiple ways. You can shoot this Olympic style, you can shoot this um, traditional style, you can shoot it a bunch of different ways. Uh, another thing is that for starters, they are usually a lot more budget friendly than say an Olympic recurve or compound setup. So typically, uh, you, the average budget would start off at about $300, um, but it can go up and down uh, depending on what you're looking at. So when starting with a traditional style bow, we will tend to recommend a takedown version for starters. Uh, there are a few reasons why. The first one is that the starting cost of these are gonna be less expensive than a one piece would be. The second one would be is that they are more future proof, as in when you do get started, chances are you'll be using a lighter draw weight to work on technique. And as you progress into your final draw weight, you can just keep the riser and all you'd have to do is switch out the limbs compared to a one piece where you'd have to get a new bow every time. 
So this makes it a lot easier because you can keep learning and keep growing into the same bow that you're used to. By just and just by changing the limbs, you end up getting um, more or less the same shooting experience that you normally would. Eventually, if you do want to transition to a one piece, we will tend to recommend doing so once you're closer to your final draw weight. That way you can put the money towards a nice bow that you really want to get, but you, can, you don't have to worry about having to switch draw, weight, draw weights uh, as often. The next option and equipment selection is going to be the Olympic recurve setup. So contrary to the traditional takedown setup or the traditional setup, these risers are going to typically be made out of aluminum or carbon, so they are going to be a little bit heavier. That being said, uh, they are, some risers are meant to take higher draw weights, so they are going to lead to a bit more of a stable shot. Another good thing with, uh, with the Olympic recurve is that they open the door to more avenues of competition. Typically, an Olympic recurve bow is used in two different disciplines, either Olympic style, which is the style you see here, or bare bow. Um, Olympic bare bow setups are going to be the type uh, for archers for, who want to shoot competitively, but don't require all these extra attachments such as sight stabilizers. Instead, they will be using uh, weights instead at the bottom to kind of drop the mass weight down a little bit, um, but they'll still be using an ARS and a plunger. So one uh, advantage you get with Olympic recurve is that you, it's a lot more tunable compared to a traditional bow. So what you'll see here, uh, most, uh, most screws you'll see here are adjustable and do help with fine tuning, tuning the bow. First one you'll see, the arrow rest. Uh, some arrow rest models are going to be adjustable in terms of height and in terms of uh, direction. The second thing you'll see is going to be a plunger here, which is used to fine tune the amount of flex that you have in the arrow just so that you can really get the most consistent shot possible. Another thing you're gonna get is going to be a sight, which will help um, eliminate the guesswork when it comes to aiming. So instead of using the point of the arrow, you would just align the aperture or dot with the center of the target, and then you adjust accordingly. Another thing you get is going to be a clicker, which is this middle piece right here, which can be used as a draw check. So just to ensure the most consistency as possible, what you do is you, as you draw back, the arrow would slide under this, and as it clicks against the, the extension here, that tells you when to release the bow. One other advantage you get with an Olympic recurve is the limb pocket system. So most bows will have what's known as an ILF setup, international limb fitting, which essentially means that the limbs are interchangeable with different brands. So if you're looking to get a riser, and you want to get a little bit of a nicer riser, you can use entry level limbs to grow in to your draw weight and then invest into a more professional set of limbs as you finalize, same, similar to the takedown setup. Another great thing about the ILF setup is that the bolts are individually, inter individually adjustable so that you can either increase or decrease the draw weight with the same set of limbs, meaning that one set of limbs will last you a bit longer than it would on a traditional screw-in style limb. So these, all, these, all these extra um, adjustments will either make you, help you be a lot more consistent or they just help you grow into the bow a lot longer. The next option for equipment is going to be compound archery. Now compound is a little bit different compared to uh, Olympic recurve or traditional. So for those who would enjoy a compound bow, typically you'll see this is very popular when it comes to hunting, uh, mainly because the short, shorter bows are easier to maneuver in the woods. And these bows are a lot more technically oriented, so you will get a lot more um, mechanical aids, which means that they're a little bit easier to uh, improve at. So the main differences you will see are going to be, like I said, the length of the bow is going to be shorter. You have the two cams that are at the end, which actually help guide the string as you draw back. So you can actually keep the bow short and still get a decent uh, draw out of it. Another thing with the cams is that they also introduce what's known as let off. So whereas a traditional recurve or longbow, any type of bow, the further you draw back, the heavier it gets. But how a compound works is actually using leverage. And once you draw back to a certain point, you actually get the weight, the weight actually drops off near the end, what's known as the let off, which means that even if a bow is 50, 60, 70 pounds, depending on what let off you have, you'd be pulling just a portion of that. So you could be holding maybe 20 or 30 pounds of that. So it makes it a lot easier to hold for a long time if you're hunting and you really need to 
hone in your shot and it helps you stabilize a little bit better. Another thing that a compound will use as opposed to a traditional recurve or Olympic recurve is going to be a trigger mechanism. So this, this uh, type of release, um, this particular one is you wrap this around, you wrap the strap around your wrist and you would use your index, but there are other models available that you, will, you would hold in your hand. Now what this does is that it helps eliminate a bit of human error in the release. So instead of wrapping around the string entirely, compounds will have a little loop here known as a D loop where this would clip onto it and you would use that to draw the bow back. And when you're ready to release, you would pull the trigger and that opens the jaw and that's how the bow would fire. So all these aids, they help, um, they help make the bow a little more accurate and a little more consistent. So it is easier to progress with a compound. The challenge with compound is that when you're in competition, the name of the game is perfection. So it is much harder to win, say, a compound tournament because the competition is, level is that much higher. Um, even at a recreational level, compound is a lot of fun to learn. It's a lot of fun to shoot. And you'll also get um, a lot more arrow speed out of it. One thing you'll see with the compound sight compared to uh, a recurve is that some models, as you can see this one here, will have multiple pins in them. So in this particular model, it is to get gauge certain distances uh, if you were to hunt. Uh, but some, some models are also upgradable to have a lens on there so you can actually magnify your target. Uh, this makes it a lot easier to aim and it makes it a lot more precise. All right, so typically the strings that you see on the compound would stay on the bow during storage. Uh, so there is no need to string and unstring it every time. That being said, when it comes to tuning a compound or making adjustments, a bit more technical knowledge is required because to make any adjustments on this, you would need a bow press, which will compress the, the limbs in, loosen up the strings so that you can make any adjustments necessary. Uh, when it comes to tuning a bow, a compound bow, a lot more factors are, are required and typically compound bows will be tuned using a method known as paper tuning where, in which you would shoot until you get a perfect hole through a piece of paper. All right, so for your typical traditional takedown setup. That was our first half. Oh, yeah, so. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> you guys got it. Uh, yeah, so this is a time if you guys have any questions about that first half. Uh, thanks so much to Brandon for the first half of that video, of course. Um, if there's any questions, you can pop them in the chat, or I think you can put your hand up. Um, and we'll go from there. And uh, Gordon, Brandon. I uh, will answer whatever questions they can. If not, they'll expand later. <laughs> yeah, and even if there are questions that are not directly, directly related to that video, but still equipment related, you guys are free to ask them and we'll do our best to answer them. Give that a few. Yeah, we'll let, we'll let people think yeah, about we'll it for them, a second. We'll let Yeah, so just to kind of explain, like the first the first half of the video is basically a very brief overview of the three main styles we deal with. Um, we still do have traditional one piece. We have target compounds, that kind of stuff. It's more just a global kind of what's what. So when people are starting off, we would, uh, we would typically give them that brief intro and then we kind of help them decide based on what they're looking for and all that kind of stuff. All right, uh, we have a question here. So for Julien, um, if a kid that shoots recurve wants their first ILF bow, what is the best 21 inch or jump directly to the 23 inch riser? Based on the height, I guess. Yeah, so you wanna take that? Yeah, yeah so um, it's based on the age of the child and their height. We try to keep uh, the longer um, riser if they can fit it, like a 23, mainly because the window's bigger when they put a sight on there if they're looking for an ILF bow. But uh, we do sell 21s as well. It just really depends on the age of the child and, and the height. And um, I would say 21 inch risers are generally lighter as well. So that would be like maybe an age that's probably below 10. And anybody above 10 would go to a 23. And if they're at least, I'd say 64 inches and in height total would probably go to a 25 inch riser at that point. Yeah, just six short limbs on there. Yeah, just short limbs on there. Because another another factor you want to look at is is 
yeah, one would be if they can manage the length of the bow and the weight of the riser. Um, but also it's for, for some people, depending on what they're looking for, if the one thing is going to be the draw weight of the limbs, because even, uh, say a 14 pound limb, if you put that on a 25 inch riser, it's 14, you go down to 23, that becomes 16, you go down to 21, that becomes 18 pounds, yeah. give or take their draw length, of course. Um, but that will factor in as well. Um, and also if you're looking to, if you're looking to have something that'll last longer, um, getting a riser that's a little bit on the longer side so they can grow into it. Um, but yeah, it would like what Ford was saying, it'll depend on their initial height, it'll depend on their um, their strength and what what kind of uh, yeah, the sight window, all that yeah. kind of stuff. So every child will be different. Yeah. All right. So the next question is not Danny Kim. So at what stage do people try and shoot multiple styles and is it recommended? At what stage? So I would say normally when I used to run lessons, about the fourth lesson, I kind of give the option to the students if they want to try different styles of archery. For example, traditional and Olympics generally taught in the course, but if they want to learn compound or just trial compound for the fourth lesson, we let them do that. At that point there, they can kind of get a feel of what they want to do in the near future. And honestly, in archery, there's so many different disciplines and so many different um, activities you can do with archery. You always try to gravitate towards uh, what suits you the best. And um, one type, one type of archery might not be um, suitable for your, your, I guess, age in life. And then later on, when you get older, you might want to switch over to that type, just because you can continue shooting and not have any restrictions in your mobility or, or what you can do. Yeah. Okay. And just to add to the, is it recommended part? What we typically recommend is once you settle into one style, uh, of course, branching out, trying different styles are, are usually, uh, they're great because you kind of really get a global view of what archery is all about. Um, but also keep in mind is that different styles will have varying techniques, even though they all, they're all based on the very similar kind of foundation. Um, but if you say, say you start off with traditional recurve or Olympic recurve and you don't have a full grasp on what the technique, the technical aspect is, is all about. So say like your alignment's still not correct, it releases off, that kind of stuff, typical beginner stuff. And you decide to switch the compound, you're going to have a harder time just because you haven't been able to grasp the technique yet. So, and same, same thing in reverse. If, uh, even if you're shooting compound and compound form hasn't really been established yet even at a basic level and you switch to recurve that's going to be a bit of a challenge as well so definitely branching out is great trying multiple styles but we normally recommend it once they have kind of have a good foundation of uh, basic technique all right the next one is uh, uh what is an example of a good entry-level recurve bow for a beginner wanting to eventually shoot uh, an olympic style recurve so in our, on our website there, we have uh, entry-level Olympic recurve setups. They don't cost that much. Um, they're ranging between, let's say, 400 to, to 500 even $600. And they give you the, all the basic necessa necessary items you need to get into Olympic-style archery. If you decide not to get into it um, after trying it out for a while and you want to blow a bear boat, that option is still available for you um, with that type of setup. The only difference is that you're not going to use a sight or stabilizers. But everything else is pretty much um, a carryover product to both types of uh, archery there. And we always recommend if you can and you want to go into Olympic style shooting is to get an entry level ILF um, Olympic bow over just a standard wooden bow. OK. Yeah, because that basically because um, and I'll explain a bit in the next part of the video that going with. Yeah, if you're starting traditional going to Olympic. It's still doable. It's just you're going to get a lot more. Um, there's a lot more tuning options on an Olympic recurve. And while we, when you start getting a basic setup, we don't, we try not to overwhelm you with all that stuff from the start. But at least getting a feel for how Olympic bows work is a good way to, uh, to kind of get started if they're for sure looking to Olympic recurve. Uh, William, what is a good starting budget for buying an Olympic recurve bow with all the gear, stabilizer, sight, et cetera? 
we actually talk about that a bit in the next next part of the video, but kind of like what Gord said, uh, the basic starter packages are going to be about five, 600 bucks, give or take based on what, what kind of stabilizers you're adding or if you're looking to upgrade the site, stuff like that. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll uh, talk about it a bit more. Um, but yeah, normally we say budget five, five, 600. And then with a little bit more case, you want to upgrade a few items. Um, Amanda, for a short draw, what would be the recommended setup? Riser length plus limb length. So the example here is 24 inches. That's, uh, that's kind of um, a question that we get asked all the time. Um, these are things that we, we ask also in question is uh, if you're looking to do Olympic setup or a bare bow setup. For a bare bow, obviously you can go with a shorter riser. Um, well, both setups you can go with shorter risers, just that how much window, one window meaning the how, how big of an opening you have in the riser for a site. In your case, I'd probably recommend a 23 inch riser um, with short limbs at 24, mainly because um, you're not getting the full bend out of those limbs at 24 inch draw. But we've seen people use 25 as well. Um, it just depends on what you want to do with that bow. So if you're doing bare bow or string walking or anything like that, you could use a taller bow. But if you're doing a limp, full Olympic setup with a sight and stabilizer, we'd probably recommend a shorter riser, like a 23. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and just to add quickly, like Mangord is saying, some people will go 25 and short just to make it a 66. Um, it also depends on what level you're looking to shoot at. So for entry, recreational, up to intermediate, those are fine. I know for high level, they prefer to stick to a 25, mainly because most risers are engineered at a 25 inch. So take that how you will. A 23 inch still performs just as well. Um, but normally for high level, they do prefer to stick to a 25. Uh, but for 99% of the cases, going 23 inch short to get a 64 inch bow would not, not say, it wouldn't make you fall short. All right. Where is the, oh, that's a good question. From uh, and from Andrew Zoris. Don't know who that guy is. <laughs> yeah, I don't um, know who that guy. <laughs> so where is the point of diminishing returns budget wise? Um, so if I did understand that question correctly is what are, what are the things that you can kind of, if you're looking for a budget, what are the things you can kind of not have to worry about so much in terms of upgrading? Um, for me, the first answer is always limbs anything that's potentially a consumable. So if you're starting off, um, and do correct me if I did get this question wrong, um, but when you're starting off, if you wanted to kind of invest a little bit more in a nicer riser, if you're going long-term, we do recommend, you can upgrade that. So instead of going for like, say a low tier, um, you can get a mid tier and have that last you a long time. With limbs, we often will often recommend pretty much get as cheap as possible. Yeah. So for a beginner level archery, we always recommend if you're going under 26 or 25 pounds, even 30 pounds to get um, an entry level limb. Um, anything that's a, a sub 150 mark would be okay. Um, generally at that, at that lower poundage, they don't feel that much different. Once you go past the 30 mark, um, there are limbs that are going to be between 200 to $500 that would be suitable for that. Anything up, and anything above 40 pounds, we always recommend a higher quality limb just because they're going to be more reliable and more durable over long term. Um, the other thing is that's consumable, as I'd say, is arrows. I would say pick an arrow that is that's suitable for your bow at the moment. Don't worry about getting higher end arrows until you get to a point where you require them. Um, Generally for scoring or for competition, you probably want higher arrows. But other than that, for beginner level, you're learning the basics and learning about the bow and how to tune and perform. Those are probably the two things that we'd always say, don't spend too much money on those two items. Mm -hmm. Okay. And just as a, uh, as a kind of general global rule, it comes down to also if, um, depends on what kind of, not only what level, but just how much you want to get out of it. If at a point you're, you're not, kind of getting your your money's worth based on say if you're just shooting recreationally a couple times a week and tuning is not really important and it's just more to kind of get out and enjoy yourself um there are some some tuning up like a plunger or something you don't necessarily need the high-end plunger you can make do with the entry-level plunger or same thing with arrow rest stuff like that just little little things that kind of 
still do the job and get what you need to, but you're not spending 160 bucks on a plunger versus say 12 to 20 bucks on a plunger. Yeah. Um, cause it won't, it won't do you much good. Um, but yeah, that's, I hope that answered your, your question. All right. That seems to be the, what we have at the moment for questions. So if anyone has any more, uh, feel free to ask them. If not, we can, I can get Zoe to, uh, play the second half of the video where we'll go a bit more into um, the specifics of what what you would expect to get with each type of bow. So I do, like I said, I do go over traditional takedown, Olympic recurve and compound, very in a brief overview. But if you do shoot, say, a one piece traditional or there's another style that you have questions about, you're free to answer, you're free to ask questions about those as well. So I think we're good. Play the second half. Takedown setup. Here's what the equipment breakdown would look like. So for starters, uh, you'll have your riser. Sorry, Brandon, could you hear audio when I played that just a second ago? Yes? Sorry. Okay. Yes, I was on. So. <laughs> Sorry, yes. thank you. I'll just do that again. All right, so for your typical traditional takedown setup, here's what the equipment breakdown would look like. So for starters, uh, you'll have your riser and your limbs to make up your bow. Um, and like we mentioned, limbs for takedown bow, if you need to go up or down in weight, all you have to do is replace the limbs rather than get a whole new bow. So that would be the first setup there. And of course you have your string uh, with the knock point as well. Your stringer for safe installation and removal of the string. For personal safety, you're going to have your arm guard and your finger tab. Finger tabs can also be, you can also switch that out for a glove if you wish to shoot a little more, um, have a bit more of a traditional feel to it. Um, typically, we'll start archers off with an arrow rest, but eventually they can move to a rug style. You'll have a quiver just for transportation of the arrows. You get your arrows as well, and which would typically be spine matched to the bow, and a traveling case just to get everything nice and um, compact for when you are moving it around. Okay, so here is what a typical Olympic recurve setup would look like. Uh, so the main component is still going to be the riser, just like what you would get with traditional archery. Now the main difference between uh, an Olympic recurve riser and a traditional riser is that in most cases, Olympic recurve, they have a different set of limb system. So for the majority of them, they will have what is known as an international limb fitting system which basically means that I can get any, most brands of limbs and I can put it into different risers. Um, so this is really important because when you're starting off, uh, limbs can vary in price from $100 for a pair to $1,200 a pair. So if you're getting started, you don't wanna be spent buying expensive limbs all the time. Similar to, uh, to traditional, you can just swap out the limbs and you can just get a, an entry level pair of limbs and put them into the same riser. Another good thing with ILF is that you can, you can actually adjust the limb weight by turning these bolts in and out. So you're not stuck with the same weight every, every time and you can actually have a set of limbs last you a bit longer than, uh, than in comparison to traditional archery. So you have your riser, your limbs. What you're also gonna have with Olympic recurve is you're gonna have a different rest and you're gonna have a plunger as well. The rest are typically gonna be made out of metal and they can either be stuck on, such as this one, or they'd be bolted on like other models. And the plunger is a, typically a spring-loaded button that will help um, fine-tune the, 
the projection of the arrow. Um, so that's, uh, that's another addition when it comes to, to tuning, which uh, you learn down the line. Another thing that you'll have with Olympic recurve is going to be a sighting aid, which helps you aim properly, or rather than having to rely on either the point of the arrow or instinctive, you have a reference point from the sight. Another big thing you'll, you'll have with the, with the Nia left bow, uh, Olympic recurve, is going to be a stabilizer setup. So most of them will have a long rod, which will stick out of the front, like you'll see here. And those help, a uh, stabilizer will help do a few things. It'll help dampen the amount of vibration there is in the bow. It'll help change the center of weight of mass to the front through the weights that you'll see at the end here. Um, and it also helps balance the side to side motion with uh, the side rods that you'll see here. So the side rods are two little rods that will go onto either side which kind of help with the torquing motion when you're shooting. Another thing an ILF bow will have is going to be a clicker, which is this piece right here. There are various different types of clickers, um, but the purpose of all of them is to essentially use, be used as a draw check. So when you're drawing back and you're shooting, just to ensure consistency, you, the arrow will pass the clicker, and once it has passed that, it will click, and that basically tells you when to release. Bow aside, the safety, the safety equipment for yourself are going to be pretty much the same. You're going to get an arm guard. Some of them will be a little bit more intricate, but an arm guard is usually an arm guard. Uh, for finger tabs, what you're going to see is going to be a little more um, complex in design compared to a traditional one. So with a, an Olympic recurve finger tab, you'll typically have a thumb shelf for your thumb to either rest above or below. You're going to see it's a solid metal plate as well to make sure your hand is in the same position. And some models will even have a bit of a pinky hook, so to give your, your middle, little finger something to grapple onto. Um, but the purpose of the tab is going to be the same as most other, most other tabs. Um, typically, you'll also have a quiver. The quivers um, can vary in design and price, but this is, would be a field quiver, which you would use when shooting on the recurve. Uh, and the arrows would be similar. What you'll notice a lot with Olympic recurve is you'll have a smaller diameter arrow for outdoor shooting, as you can see here. Uh, the main reason being is that Olympic recurve is meant to be shot um, competitively at a distance of 70 meters for seniors. So you want to make sure you have an arrow that can adequately reach that distance. So they'll typically be thinner and lighter than your standard traditional or aluminum arrow. So one thing you'll notice with Olympic recurve is that all, with all the equipment you have here, it's going to be hard to fit it in the little carrying case that we showed you for the traditional setup. So what you typically use is a backpack style um, case, which will be able to fit uh, all your equipment and then some depending on the size. And they all usually have an arrow tube inside or on the outside that you can extend and fit your arrows and stabilizers in, just so you have enough room for everything. So for compound equipment, um, you'll see that there, there are fewer things uh, included. Um, the, num the list of, uh, of accessories can go up depending on what type of compound you're getting. Uh, typically with most starter compound sets, uh, they do come in a, some do come in a package which will typically include the bow itself, um, which would include, it would also include an arrow rest uh, and it would include a multi-pin sight. Some of them, if you're getting a hunting setup, would also have a bow-mounted quiver and a small stabilizer with it. Uh, even if your bow doesn't include this, these are all items that you can purchase separately. So with that, with compound, you don't need as much to get you going. So if you get a, ba a basic setup with uh, some of the attachments already included, the other things you would need to get would be a release. So as opposed to a finger tab, a release is a mechanical trigger that can either be used with the wrist or you have some that are held in the hand um, that are basically help you shoot a little bit different. The release would just clip on to the D loop here and then you would use this to release for you. So you could get a release and then of course arrows for it which would be spine match as every other model. And then a carrying case, a typical carrying case for a compound would be a little bit different. Um, Rarely are backpack style, but you can see that the shape would kind of match a compound and you have different pockets for the accessories as well. So with all this kind of setup, uh, is usually a good starting point to get you going with compound archery. 
So there's our brief overview of the main styles of traditional and competitive archery. To give you an idea on budget for each style, a uh, traditional takedown would generally start off at about $300, for Olympic recurve can start off at about five or $600, and compound would start off at about $800 or so. Note that these prices are subject to change depending on what combinations of equipment you go for or what accessories you might add, but that'll give you a basic idea of where to start and what to, what to budget for when looking for your equipment. Also, as a reminder, we always recommend taking lessons and consulting a certified instructor before purchasing any type of equipment. That way you can be sure to be properly assessed based on your height, draw length, and uh, draw weight capacities before purchasing a bow so we can ensure that the bow is, is properly set up for you. For more information on looking for equipment, you can always visit our website at CanadaArtreeOnline.com or give us a call or send us an email. And if you are looking to get into archery, you can always look at the Archery Canada website who can put you in contact with your provincial sports organization to get you started today. Cool. All right. So, oh, I have stuff in the Q&A here. I hope we didn't miss that from the first half. All right, cool. All right, so I will, cool, we'll go to the Q&A now. Yep. All right, so the first one uh, from Linda, or sorry, I'll do Margaret here, because I was in the Q&A. Do you do video consultations with people who would like to purchase from you, but don't live near the shop? It's actually a phone consultation where we, where we talk through it. Um, we don't really do a video consultation, uh, mainly because there's a lot of things involved, but the phone consultation is usually good enough for what you're looking for. Um, if there's any questions of, regarding the phone consultation, we generally help you out with that. Yeah, Okay. so we do phone consultations. Um, they do have great success. One thing I usually tend to recommend though with the phone consultation, just due to the nature of it, when you're, if you're not in the shop, sometimes recommendations are gonna be a little bit tougher, um, but we can usually give our best, our best recommendation with the information we get. But yes, that is a great question. All right, and then uh, Linda. All right, so the gist of the question is, for target archery, do you follow world, world archery recommendation of 40 inches plus your draw length for overall bow length for an ILF bow used recurve or bare bow? So basically, if someone had a 28 inch draw, 40 plus 28, 68 inches. Um, yeah, I would say we're pretty close, but we don't really follow that particular one. We just, yeah. based on, uh, what we've used in the past and our experience with, with people's draw length and height. Yeah, it wouldn't be like a direct thing, but I'm pretty sure for most of the recommendations that and we end up being, end up making, they do follow, they do pretty much follow that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so that would be kind of a good, that's like a good hard rule to follow if you were. Um, but of course there are always gonna be a few, a few uh, variations from that. Um, and so to conclude, while we don't follow it directly, it pretty much kind of indirectly, it ends up being, it ends up following that more or less. Oh, thank you. It's a great question. All right. Uh, Scotty, I'm shooting a one piece recurve weight rated 46 pounds at 28. My drawing is only 24. What spine weight arrow do I want? Ooh, that's I'm, a assuming, I'm assuming it's a, it's like a traditional bow, right? Yeah. If that's the case. Then, um, at, at four inches shorter than measured 48 at uh, 28. So every inch less than 28 is, is two pounds yeah. lighter. So you're looking at eight pounds less than 46, which makes it 38. Now, the second question is if you're leaving the arrows full length or not, because we don't really recommend cutting arrows past 26 most of the time. So if you look at our website, our shortest cut length is like these 25 or 25 and a half um mainly because you want to keep those nodes in that arrow so i would say that um, if your minimum arrow length is going to be 26 28 i'd say at 38 pounds of your drawing you'd be suitable with a probably 700 800 to 600 spine arrow um in your case um but once again the arrow the, the poundage and the uh and the arrow length is very important. It depends um, on point weight as well. It's sorry. traditional. Yeah. So I would say I would say in your case, Scotty, it'd be it'd be around seven hundred to six hundred spine. Yeah. 
Okay, and that's that's we assume that's a traditional arrow, meaning it has feathers on it, and uh, probably a 100 to 125 grain point weight. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. All right, Andrew asked, how do you fit a finger tab, and how do you use the dust pieces like the shelf, palm plate, and pinky hook? All right, I can I can take care of this one. Um, so the main few factors, I can get a few more if needed, but uh, I have I have a few here to kind of explain all that. Um, the main two things that I'll look at are going to be your the hand width when you're holding when you have the the tab in your hand and the length of the leather. So this one here is a new one, leather's untrimmed or anything like that. So if you're holding it in your hand, typically I would have, if you can kind of see here, the tab is more or less covering all three fingers, even with my fingers in the spacer. Uh, and while there is a bit of variation, that's more or less where I feel um, comfortable. So say if I put this tab in Gord's hand, Gord has larger hands than I do, probably would not. It might still fit because it is a big large, but you can also see yeah, I can't fit on my finger. Yeah, so if you show it, you'll see that his hand, his three fingers are kind of passing a good amount. So he would probably go for an extra large if they even made this model yeah. an extra large. Um, different brands will have different sizing. So I'm a large for Shibuya, but a medium for a uh, Wheelwist tab. It it all depends on, on what you're doing. Um, so that would be the main thing. But the most important one, honestly, even before this, is just making sure that the leather, as you curl your fingers, you see that it's well past my my three fingers. That's what we're looking for because ultimately, um, that's what's going to be protecting your your fingers from the string. Um, tabs will be trimmed over time uh, just to make sure that you don't have any excess leather coming off. But you do want to make sure that you have a good amount of length. You'll notice that when it is flat, my pinky and my index might pass a little bit. If it's about if it's right if it's still before uh, the first knuckle. That means you're you're typically okay because as you curl, you'll see that you it passes quite a bit. Um, so that yeah, so adjustability in the spacer you can correct for that. The spacers will move front and back by a small amount. Uh, most tabs will allow for this. Uh, the only one is the fair weather, but that's pretty fixed as is. Uh, so if you are having issues with it, that can also help, but that will also change your hook into the string. So if I have the spacer further back, I'll exaggerate. I wouldn't have fold it this far back. I have more space, but now my hook is a lot more shallow. So that would be another thing to look into as I, as I am sizing a tab. So adjusting pieces like the shelf, palm plate, and pinky hook. So some tabs will have a palm plate, such as this one. Uh, this one's adjustable. Some tabs, such as the Tech One or the Saker, will just have a fixed palm plate. And some tabs like the AE or the Shibuya have nothing on it. So the palm plate is basically used so that when you're pulling the string, you're not curling your handed. Basically, you're only curling from your fingers while your knuckles are meant to stay flat. The palm plate just kind of helps remind you to not do that. And you'll see it'll press if you if you do. So palm plate adjustment is going to be partially functional, partially comfort. You can have it all the way out. And yes, it does mean that you're less likely to move your hand, but also it becomes a bit tougher to kind of set your hand incorrectly because you have this thing that's kind of always pushing against your, your palm. Um, so this one, I have it pretty much all the way in just because I want a reminder, but I don't want, I don't want to be interfering. And then the, so that's palm plate more or less. Shelf is a little bit more, um, tricky because that'll depend on where your anchor is and what kind of spacing you want. Um, some people, they want full shelf contact. You can have it with your thumb either above or below the shelf. I have all my tabs below with my thumb below the shelf. And I kind of want to make a little bit of a cup for my hand so that I can get into anchor nice and properly. Some people like to have the shelf really high up so that they can kind of nudge it in but there's still a bit of a gap. It's personal preference, but at a beginner level, I don't usually recommend it. Um, so yeah, um, the shelf here is going to be a little bit tricky. It takes trial and error with an instructor to figure out. And then last but not least, the pinky hook. I did mention that in the video. Some of them will have it. Some of them will have it and it's adjustable and some of them don't. Um, personally, I do not like the pinky hook. That's just my personal Yep. opinion as a coach some coaches do like it for beginners 
is very handy to have because a lot of people, what they'll do is that they'll, they'll really force the pinky and you kind of see the pinky affects uh, the other finger. So you add tension into your hand. So the pinky hook just kind of lets it sit there and you don't have to worry about it. But I'm personally, and I think we're doing the same, yeah. is that once you don't need it anymore, we tend to take it off just because you're, it kind of helps your three fingers work a little bit more independently. Well, I, I'm a lot older than Brandon, so back in my days, there was no pinky hook. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just used to that. Back anymore. when I was a boy. <laughs> um, perfect. So yeah, I hope that answers the question. So yeah, a lot of it will be preference with some functionality, but we always recommend if you're making that kind of adjustment, we can all, only give our best recommendation based on our experience. It's usually best to work that with an instructor and whatever work helps you shoot best in the end. All right, cool. When ordering a recurve all in one kit, do you guys cut and prep arrows too? So it depends on the kit. Um, some of them will have pre-made arrows, meaning that they're set length. And those lengths are gonna be between, let's say 28 to like 30 inches, depending on what pound you're buying. Now, I always do recommend buying a pounder that is gonna be suitable for your level of archery. So if you're doing this on your own or you're a beginner, they haven't done archery before and not taking a lesson or anything like that, try to buy something under 24 pounds. Um, don't go too high. Now, the other kits do have arrows that can be cut. Um, we're talking about like the ones that are coming with radius arrows. They'll be cut and prepped, but we also don't recommend cutting arrows right away, mainly because you don't know your draw length yet. In a, and if you're buying a beginner level kit, um, you won't know your draw length until you start shooting it for a while and see how you feel. So I would say if you do buy the higher end kits and you need your arrows uh, prepped, just ask for them to be points to be glued in. And we use hot melt for that, which means that they're reversible. All you need to do is heat up the point again and pull them back out. Um, if you do buy at the store level here, we, we measure and we make sure that the arrow is long enough for you. Um, our standard arrow length for the ones that do require um, cutting, those ones are 32 and a half inch. So they're fairly long. And there's and we picked those arrows because they're suited, suited for everyone, especially with people that are taller. So um, yeah, so it depends on the kit. Um, the lower end kits will come pre-made arrows. The higher end kits will be required um, at least the gluing point. And we do that here uh, free of charge if you buy the kit from us. Okay. And also when if you are getting recurve packages as well, um, yeah, we can do the bow setup, and that's another option. Yeah. Nice. The bow set up, you know, usually people struggle, um, especially when they're getting fit and they're not oh. part of a club. Especially if it's Olympic recurve. Olympic recurve. There's a lot yeah. of small tuning aspects. So in, in 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 the kits, if you like, when you do do, do check out, just ask to be a setup, and we do the limb alignment, knock point, arrow rest, plunder so setting, I, tiller. Yeah. Make sure everything's correct before you get it, so that you can just click everything together. And also check up our YouTube channel. Our YouTube channel does have, when you do get your kit, does have a tutorial how to put that together. There's two tutorials. One is for a takedown recurve, which is the wooden bows with the knobs. And the other one's the ILF um, tutorial. If you follow that tutorial with your kit, you should be in pretty good shape on how to assemble that thing together. Okay? Cool. All right. Um, any other last minute questions? Oh, those are all answered. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, okay, if there aren't, Cool. If there are, if you come up with a question, because this happens often, um, where you 10 minutes later, are like, oh, I could have asked this. Um, you can always contact us at our helpline, helpicanarcheonline.com, and we'll do our best to answer them. If you are looking or know someone who's looking to get into it, um, booking a consultation from at our pro shop or through the phone consultation helpline is another option. Um, and yeah, if you're looking to get into archery and you're not sure where, Archery Canada has the resources for your provincial sports organization and can get you started. So, cool. Perfect. Thanks so much. Um, both huge thank you to you, Brandon, as well as you, Gordon. I'm sure everyone found incredible value in that. Um, and as I think we mentioned in our chat, it'll be available on our YouTube channel to kind of rewatch and relearn if you want to. As Brandon said, you can also reach out to Canada Archery Online through their help at our, uh, canadaarcheryonline.com. Um, and thank you everyone so much for joining. This has been great. And uh, we'll put this up on our YouTube for everyone to watch again. Thanks so much, Brandon cool. and Gord.
Thank, thank you, you guys. And uh, shout out to Danny as well, who did our video and editing and all that kind of stuff. So thank you, Danny. Um, and yeah, thank you, Zoe and Carl, for the, the opportunity. I think it was a lot of fun. Thanks, guys. Everyone have a great day. Cool. Thank you, too.